Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the annual Augustine Henry Forestry Lecture. <clears throat> we are delighted that Dr. David Stiles has agreed to present this year's Augustine Henry Lecture. This event is organised by the Society of Irish Foresters and facilitated by Theresa O'Brien and the Irish Bioenergy Association. I would like to thank Theresa for her work and Pat O'Sullivan, also the Technical Director of the Society of Irish Foresters. The Society of Irish Foresters was founded in 1942 and it represents the interests of more than 700 members, representing a cross-section of people involved in or with the forestry sector, but mainly professional foresters. Um, <clears throat> those of you joining today can feed your questions into the Q&A box, and we'll pick up as many of these as possible after David's talk. <clears throat> First of all, I'd just like to um, uh, just say a few words about the um, uh, uh, Gustin Henry Lecture itself. I think they've disappeared off the screen at the moment. Um, just one second. Apologies for this. We'll get it back as soon as we can. Okay. Um, Augustine Hill was born on the 2nd of July, 1857. He was brought up in Cootstown, County Tyrone, uh, educated at Queen's College, Belfast, and uh, also NUI, what, the University of Galway, Queen's University of Galway, I think it was called then, is now NUIG. <clears throat> Went from there to Edinburgh University, where he fast-tracked a medical degree and he was appointed medical officer in the Chinese Imperial Maritime Customs Service at Shanghai and Yishang in central China. Um, <clears throat> bored at the time with his uh, weekends in the uh, customs, he actually began collecting plants throughout China and uh, he left his job in 1900 and he, at that stage he had sent 158,000 dried specimens representing more than 6,000 different species including 1,726 new plant discoveries. And these were sent to universities, or sorry, botanic gardens, such as I think Scotland, Kew, and our own botanic gardens here in Ireland. For a while he trained as a forester in Nancy in, in, in France. And it was there he met uh, Henry John Elways, a rich benefactor uh, in the north uh, east of England. And between them, they actually decided that they would write the definitive book on trees uh, internationally, known uh, as Trees of Great Britain and Ireland. Um, and what they did, uh, this really was a pioneering work, the first of its kind really, and they, they decided that they would locate, measure, photograph and illustrate tree species around the world that had potential as forest or parkland trees in Ireland and Britain. Um, finally, after 10 years, they completed the volume, uh, the seven volumes, followed by an index, which in many ways is a is a volume all on its own. Um, uh, the Society of Irish Foresters, I was involved in a few projects, in a project a few years ago, we, where we've reproduced all um, eight volumes, including the, um, the index. And um, anybody who's interested in those can always e email info at soif.ie, and I'm sure there are still some copies available. <clears throat> but it wasn't just this book that shaped forestry in Ireland, and indeed uh, Britain as well. Um, he would have influenced species selection in Ireland. First of all, in the species trials, which were established in the beginning of the last century in Avondale. And uh, he really, from his trip around the world, he began to actually get a greater knowledge of trees and what climates that would suit them. And up to that, and most foresters were looking at trees here in Ireland and were looking at trees throughout Europe. And uh, Henry actually basically said that the European climate wasn't uh, similar to the um, kind of climate we have in Ireland, uh, the, which is influenced by the Gulf Stream. And he actually said at that stage that we should look uh, beyond Europe. Um, so 
he said that we should look at climate that are similar to Ireland. And at that, at that stage, he basically looked at what was happening, what kind of trees were growing in British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and California. And he said, all of these trees without exception that grow on the Pacific coast have done extremely well in Ireland. And uh, he was also outward looking in the fact that he said that species exotic or foreign has nothing to do with the question as whether it should be planted or not. So he basically was looking at forestry from an international perspective. Um, so at that stage, I did turn west towards a similar latitude to Ireland and the area that that um, Henry was uh, was discussing. And these, in many ways, were the trees that shaped Irish forestry in the following 100 years. And it's of laterally that uh, we are again looking at native species and European species. But these were the species from our, certainly from about 1950 up to 2000 were the main species. Uh, the society has long appreciated Henry's work as a forester, botanist and plant collector. Uh, as the monument which the society erected uh, in uh, 1954 says, he enriched our knowledge of trees. That's basically a quick uh, run through um, Augustine Henry's life. Um, the Augustine Henry lecture has addressed a wide range of topical subjects over the years, and today's subject is topical as it addresses the role of forestry in achieving climate neutrality. Uh, our guest speaker has similarities with, with um, with Augustin Henry in the fact that he, he believes there's an, an urgency to actually explore forestry and increase forest cover in Ireland to actually achieve, achieve the kind of greenhouse gas um, targets that we are talking about in Ireland and that was, is now part of the government's climate change strategy. Our guest speaker is senior lecturer in agri sustainability at the NUI Galway and he's co-director of, of the university's new agricultural science BSc programme. Since 2004, he has specified in life cycle assessment of food, bioproduct, energy, and waste management systems at TCD, Ireland's EPA, the European Commission, JRC, Bangor University, NUIG, as I said, and University of Limerick as well. His research group applies advanced life cycle analysis to investigate the sustainability of novel value chains with a particular emphasis on understanding inter-system effects. Uh, he recently coordinated research on the long-term greenhouse gas mitigation of commercial forestry in the UK and leads the EPA Department of Agriculture funded sequester project, which identifies pathways towards climate neutrality in Ireland's agricultural and land sector. His subject today is forests, wood products and bioenergy, critical elements of climate neutrality. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Dr. David Steins. Thank you very much, Daniel, for the comprehensive introduction. I'm just going to um, get my screen to share. And so it seems to be working. Hopefully you can yep. all see that. So today, um, thanks again, Donald, for the introduction. And thanks very much uh, to Donald and the Society of Irish Foresters for the invitation to present today. Um, as Donald mentioned, this topic of forestry and the role of forestry in climate mitigation has become very central to our research over the last few years. We started out looking at, at climate neutrality and at, at wood value chains and have actually been surprised by how strongly we now think they can contribute to, to climate mitigation. And so today I'd like to present some insight, if you like, from that research over the last few years um, into the role of, of forestry and wood use and downstream use of wood as well, because that seems very important for extending the longevity of the carbon sink, if you like, and the, and the max, maximization, maximizing the carbon offsets, the carbon reduction we can achieve with, with forests. So I'd like to acknowledge also people who have been working, colleagues who have been working on those projects um, over the last few years, such as Colm Duffy, Remy Prudhomme, Ailey Forster in, in the UK, and John, John Healy in Bangor, Karen Diamonds, Mary Ryan, and Colin O'Donoghue in NURG in Chagas. So, this is a kind of synthesis, if you like, of some of that work we've done over the last few years. And um, I suppose I should caveat here that I, um, much as I talk about forestry these days and we see the, the importance of it, I'm, I'm shamefully ignorant about tree species identification and ecology and botany. So I, I apologize in advance for that. And if you see any gross errors or misuse of nomenclature or anything, please excuse me for that. I'm sure 
uh, Augustine Henry would be turning in his grave if he if he knew how little I know about some of these tree species. So I apologise in advance and uh, would like to emphasise I'm taking a kind of systems perspective to look at the role that trees through their life cycle can play in uh, contributing to our climate emergency uh, challenge. So the, the format of the presentation is to firstly look at Ireland's Athaloo pickle, as we might call it, the challenge we have there, and then just illustrate some simple visions of what climate neutrality might look like for Ireland in 2050. Um, that shows the relative importance of trees, and then we go on to look at which trees should we plant then and where should we plant them and at a very broad level, thinking about some of the benefits of conservation forests versus commercial forests. Um, and then we can think about what's going to drive this afforestation and these big targets for afforestation, um, what levers can we pull, and to finally draw some conclusions. And hopefully, um, it, this will stimulate a bit of discussion and some questions at the end to leave plenty of time for, for those questions. So the Afalu pickle. Well, um, we know that we've got a huge problem in Ireland with our agriculture and land use sector in terms of climate targets because we're a long way away from those targets and we're moving in the wrong direction. So we have about 25 million tonnes of CO2 um, from the agriculture sector. We've got another 10 million tonnes, uh, oh sorry, we've got about 25 million tonnes of CO2 net emission from the agriculture and land use sector. So we've got about 20 million tonnes from agriculture, about 10 million tonnes from drained organic soils, and we've got quite modest offsets at the moment, about 2 million tonnes per year from grasslands of CO2 and about 5 to 6 million tonnes of CO2 in trees and wood products annually. And the challenge is that that forestry sink is declining rapidly and is soon to become a source, not least because we've got new revised emission factors for the large areas of forests which are planted on organic soils, which can make them a net source of emissions. And we've got an ageing forest stands, very low planting over the last decade or so. And so the profile means that changing profile of forestry means it's, it's becoming much less of a sink as time goes by. Um, so the situation is actually set to get worse rather than better. And that's why when we think about climate mitigation, uh, we probably have more of a chance of, of thinking about doing something meaningful for 2050 than we do for 2030, because it takes so long as we'll see to get some of those carbon offsets in the ground. And obviously, if we talk about net zero, net zero is a balance. It's actually getting the, the emissions to be no more than the sinks. And so we're a huge distance away from that net zero balance, as we'll see in a minute. One of the reasons we find ourselves in this situation and that there's a new urgency is because the Paris Agreement signed in 2015 really focused minds on climate stabilization. And up to then, we've thought a lot about reducing the carbon intensity of production because we've got a relatively low emission profile or a low carbon footprint of milk and beef in Ireland. I think there was a, a sense that that's fine, that we're not, we're playing our role in the world, if you like, in providing milk and beef at relatively low impacts. But actually, when you look at an absolute emissions basis, uh, we still have very high emissions because we've got such large amounts of production of milk and beef in Ireland. Meanwhile, we don't have a big sink, we don't have a high forest cover, and we've got a huge emission source of almost useless emissions, if you like, from drained organic soils, um, which emit a huge amount per hectare, 20 tonnes of CO2 per hectare, but don't contribute much to productivity. And then we've got different accounting mechanisms. So at the European level, up to now, we've been using a net net accounting approach. So we've been thinking, what's our change in land use emissions relative to land use emissions in the past? And of course, we've always had very high, as long as we've been accounting, we've always had very high organic soil emissions. So we've just been relating to that baseline and that baseline has stayed high, but we haven't counted how high that baseline itself is. Whereas moving to net zero, we've got to think about all those emissions, not on a net net basis, but on a gross net basis. What's our total emissions? and our offsets need to offset all of those emissions uh, going forward to 2050. So that's why we find ourselves with a, with a big challenge, if you like, um, and there's a, there's a huge role um, for trees to play here uh, in order to help address that balance, which is what we'll look at in a few minutes. So what, what could climate neutrality look like? It's obviously going to look very different from what we have at the moment. But first, we need to think about how do we define climate neutrality? And it's not quite as simple as we thought at the beginning of the work that we did for the EPA and Sequester, because 
Although we use the so-called GWP100 approach for CO2 equivalent accounting in national inventory reporting, where we count methane and nitrous oxide and CO2 with global warming potential equivalents, we don't actually, um, we might not be using that approach moving forward because there could be separate treatment of methane, which, which could be beneficial for Ireland, um, but also means that, that we might have separate methane targets that will also have to be met. So one definition that we think might be quite important in the future is that we achieve a balance between CO2 emissions and um, nitrous oxide emissions, N2O, and an important factor for that is to consider that every one kilogram of nitrous oxide is equivalent to about 265 kilograms of CO2 because of its relative lifetime and warming effect whilst it's in the atmosphere. So for every one kilogram of nitrous oxide emitted, we need to remove from the atmosphere um, into soils or into trees 265 kilograms of CO2. So there's a lot of heavy lifting to be done by CO2 to offset those nitrous oxide emissions. Meanwhile, if we have a separate target for methane, um, that won't be easy either. Uh, it doesn't need to get down to zero to, to get to climate neutrality, but it's estimated we need to reduce methane by about 24 to 47% globally in order to achieve climate neutrality relative to 2010. So we're gonna have a significant reduction in methane that's going to be needed to comply with our international Paris Agreement obligations in the long term, alongside trying to balance the CO2 and the N2O. So a lot of what we talk about today will be the role of forestry in achieving that balance by removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Just to elaborate a little bit on that, we'll, we'll park methane to the side. On the left here, we assume that we meet whatever ambitious target there's going to be for methane reduction by 2050. That leaves us to balance out CO2 and N2O through time. So we can do this in different ways. We can not reduce our agricultural emissions or our organic soil emissions very much, maybe just re-wet 25% of our organic soil area, reduce agricultural emissions by 25%. But if we do that, <clears throat> to get to balance, we, by definition, we need a massive CO2 sink, and that would equate to planting up to 1 million hectares of trees by 2050, which is a planting rate of almost 40,000 hectares per year, depending on the tree mix. So that's probably unrealistic, which implies that we have to do a lot more to reduce emissions from agriculture and organic soils to have a realistic chance of balancing those emissions with, with trees, which are the, the main, the primary sink, if you like, for emissions uh, in the land use context. We've got a massive amount of carbon stored in soils. The soils, grassland soils are very close to saturation in carbon. There's probably not much scope to increase that carbon very much. So Trees are really the main lever we have to, to achieve this offset in these green bars below, below the line here. So if we go to a different scenario, we might reduce our agricultural emissions by 75% somehow and re-wet 75% of organic soils, which means we only need to plant 13 to 16,000 hectares per year of forestry, which is still twice the current target, but is a, is a manageable quantity. And that would increase the total area of forest by 0.4 million hectares by uh, 2050. But of course, to achieve that scale of reduction in the agriculture sector probably means we've got to reduce agricultural output because we can probably only decouple our emissions so far. And it's unlikely we'd meet our methane target um, without reducing animal numbers by seven, uh, without reducing emissions by, um, by 75%. So we probably have to reduce our animal numbers to get there. Something that might be achievable is to, is to try and get a 50% reduction in, in agricultural emissions of um, N2O and CO2, and we can do that with switching fertilizer types using much more grass clover swords, carefully managing manures. It's possible with a lot of abatement we could get there with, with not too much reduction in animal numbers, um, but we'd need to be very ambitious in our organic soil re-wetting, 90% of organic soil areas re-wetted, and that would mean that we'd need to uh, plant about 15 to 18,000 hectares of trees every year from 2025 until 2050. So still we need to be very ambitious in forestry, we need to be very ambitious in um, agriculture, but there's more of a balance here, if you like, in the degree of ambition between the different sectors. So it's not going to be easy to get to neutrality. We're going to have to be very ambitious in all sectors, but the less ambitious we are in one, the more ambitious we have to be in another. And if we don't do that, then we simply have to massively reduce our food output, our, our milk and beef output. <clears throat> Those are the only ways, numerically, of getting to climate neutrality. It's a, a simple zero-sum game. <clears throat> 
So we can see as we move from left to right, we're generally increasing our mitigation effort, trying to drive down those emissions more and more, and that reduces the amount of forestry we need to offset those emissions. But um, the offset, the offset effort obviously goes in the opposite direction. The less we reduce our emissions, the more we need to offset. So it's a simple kind of zero sum game. And we need to think about the Apple sector as a whole. So it's not just a question about emissions, but it's a question about land, because um, in this scenario on the left, it's probably very unrealistic, not just because we need a large area of planting every year, but because we'd be taking 25% of land out of agricultural production. And could we maintain very high agricultural production whilst doing that? It's not, it's not certain that we could. So there's a land and there's a greenhouse gas balance that we need to achieve, if you like, in the Afalu sector long term, and that would be easy. And we've seen how important then that the, the removals will be from, from trees as the main source of carbon dioxide removals in the land sector through time. The other point about that, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, is that trees take time to be planted and they take time to grow. So if you've got a rolling planting strategy of, say, 20,000 hectares of trees per year, um, you're only really going to start, if we start in the next couple of years with that strategy, we're only really going to start delivering serious offsets by the, the um, mid 2030s at the earliest um, going through. And those, those offsets will increase all the way up to 2050 and beyond. Now there's issues about what happens after that, which we'll look at in a few minutes, but, but basically uh, to get to 2050 we, uh, balance, we need to start planting very soon just because of the time it takes for the planting and then for the sequestration in the young trees as they start to develop and accelerate in their growth. So we're not unfortunately going to be able to do much with, with new planting for the 2030 carbon budget. And this is where people talk about alternative management of, of current for existing forest stands to help contribute to that particular um, challenge in 2030 in the short time frame. But we also need to think about whether there are trade-offs there and whether there might be uh, whether that approach would be consistent with scaling up a bio-based economy, which might be what we need to, to drive much more afforestation and the long-term targets, the long-term sinks that we're going to need for uh, climate mitigation. So in summary, the, to, to summarise, if you like, the role of forestry and neutrality, it's clear that we've got a very high mitigation effort in agricultural and organic soils that we're going to need to meet. If we meet very high mitigation in those uh, big emitting sectors, we can uh, leave space, if you like, for manageable, ambitious but manageable areas of afforestation of 13 to 18,000 hectares per year to get to a climate neutral balance by 2050. That in itself, though, is already double the current policy target, which is only about 8,000 um, hectares per year of planting. So it's clear that policy is some way off where we need to be if we're seriously talking about climate neutrality by 2050. Um, and that still means we need a minimum of 0.6 million hectares of area to be dedicated or diversified, if you like, over to re-wetting of organic soils on the one hand and to new forestry on the other hand. But that's only for the AFLU sector, the agriculture and land use sector. And we know that it's going to be impossible to drive down emissions to absolutely zero from other sectors, in particular for sectors like cement production, where we've got calcination emissions. Um, uh, during the process, in addition to all the fossil fuels that are burned, and we've got aviation, which is very difficult to decarbonize. We might have some kind of dispatchable requirement for, for electricity from some natural gas to, to balance out um, wind and solar in the future. So we might not have 100% decarbonization of those sectors. So any residual emissions from those sectors will also need to be balanced out by the land sector, which means most likely we're going to need significantly more than 20,000 hectares per year to be planted just if we're to, to numerically achieve balance, I know it's challenging, but this, these are the kind of numbers we need to talk about if we're going to actually realistically achieve balance um, without having to significantly reduce um, outputs in the agricultural sector. Um, and of course, the bioeconomy is going to require other feedstocks, um, which will include woods, but might include other things, uh, other, other, it might even be grass or miscanthus, uh, other types of cellulosa crops, so we need to dedicate area to those, um, those kind of bioeconomy feedstocks in the future too. So it's quite clear that if we take the Paris Agreement seriously at face value and we really aim for climate neutrality, we're going to have to have a pretty radical land use diversification in Ireland over the next 25 to 30 years. So now we can perhaps start thinking about how do we 
ensure that we have longevity from that mitigation because we know that eventually trees start growing and um, we might have issues about how we maintain that balance through time. So that's what we'll think about now where we think about which trees do we plant and, and where do we plant them. So firstly, in terms of um, conservation forests, there's kind of semi-natural uh, species. There's a, a lot of work that's been done on ecosystem services that's delivered by these forests, and apologies for probably mispronouncing this, but uh, Shinrin Yoku, forest bathing, I think it's a Japanese term that relates to basically taking in the ambience of forest medicine, if you like. And it's been well shown that um, spending time in forests is a good way to reduce blood pressure, to increase well-being, And that in itself is massively valuable. So we can see it can, more forests can <clears throat> help us to, to reduce stress and anxiety, to disconnect from work, uh, increase our immunity, lift our mood, improve sleep, etc. So these benefits, actually, people would pay a lot of money for. So they're actually worth something. They're, they're actually worth quite a lot. And that's something that conservation type forestry in particular could help to deliver. So th there's a lot of human derived value, if you like, from conservation forests that could be planted to, to really improve our well-being, but also to deliver other benefits around biodiversity, around flood regulation, um, around water quality by helping to mop up nutrients from adjacent, adjacent agricultural areas. Um, so some papers have looked at this and, and have generally shown that um, increasing management intensity, as you see from left to right here, is generally associated with increasing the fiber productivity. We often increase the, the yield of the forest, the, the growth of the forests, but we we lose other ecosystem services such as uh, biodiversity. We reduce health um, recreational benefits, water quality benefits, flood protection benefits. So there's a trade-off, if you like, between maximizing carbon sequestration, which we might want to do for climate mitigation, and delivering wider ecosystem services, which are very valuable and that we need as well at landscape level. Um, so we are going to have to think carefully about where we put forests to try and deliver more of these values and to ensure that we include a good mix of conservation type forests in the forestry not just to deliver on climate mitigation benefits, but to deliver on these other ecosystem services. And in general, more species, larger and older trees, and less management seems to point towards greater aggregate ecosystem service delivery. We can also, also think about integrating trees into farms in, in hedgerows or in single trees, and, and these can have other benefits in terms of providing windbreaks and shelter, um, biodiverse, biodiversity habitats and also corridors within landscapes for, for biodiversity to move across landscapes. We've also got aesthetic value that is derived from this, that's an ecosystem service. We can support pollinators with, um, with various flowering trees, etc., and we can store significant amounts of carbon also in, in hedgerows, although much less than in, in forests, obviously. Potentially, we can reduce runoff and nutrient losses, especially if we plant trees strategically adjacent to water strips or down hills to uh, intercepts water runoff uh, during winter, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of possible benefits that can derive from tree planting within agricultural landscapes, even if they're not in large uh, kind of woodland blocks. So that, there's a clear role then uh, for conservation forests. And I'm not really an expert in conservation forests or in um, ecosystem services, but I can see that there's a lot of literature that supports the idea of quite significant benefits, which if they were monetized would actually be pretty valuable uh, in terms of uh, what, what, what conservation forests can deliver. So now we look at, at commercial forests, and this is where we've done more, more work from a life cycle perspective to try and understand what the life cycle mitigation can be from trees which are grown and harvested over a few cycles. Um, so firstly, I'll show that if we, if we looked at um, a semi-natural forest, it was much slower growing than the commercial forest. So this dotted line, um, the first dotted line you see on the graph on the top right, basically represents the net mitigation over 100 years in the UK context, 2020 to 2120, um, from, in this case, only the terrestrial carbon storage of a semi-natural forest. And we can see that it's, it's quite a modest amount in relation to the total mitigation we can achieve with commercial forests. And that's because of the slower growth rates the fact that we start to level off um, growth and therefore level off carbon uptake after 100 years or so. 
So that's that's where the role of commercial forests becomes quite interesting because we tend to grow those faster growing species, which uh, Donald showed Augustine had identified from the west coast of the of uh, North America and brought across to Ireland, and they grow very well. Sitka spruce, um, Douglas fir, etc. They produce very high yields, maybe. 20 cubic meters per hectare per year or more at peak yield, we can easily calculate the carbon that's in that biomass. And if we do the calculations just in the standing biomass alone, um, or in the main trunks of the standing biomass alone, we could be talking about 15 tons of CO2 equivalent uh, per hectare per year uptake um, every year. And then we've got black branches, roots, roots and litter. So we could be talking about an uptake of over 20 tons of CO2 equivalent per hectare per year, which is quite a significant uptake. Um, so we can see then that if we if we plant these commercial trees, we end up with much more rapid uptake, especially in the first first forty years uh, before those trees are harvested. And then this is based on a rolling planting again in the UK context: thirty thousand hectares planted every year from twenty twenty up to twenty fifty. But then looking at the emissions out to twenty one twenty. We see we have with the rolling planting we've got a gradual increase in the in the terrestrial carbon storage in the blue then we start to harvest those trees from the 2060s on <clears throat> and uh, so we start to remove some of that terrestrial carbon um, before replanting and then that carbon starts to accumulate again so if we only consider the terrestrial carbon we do end up with a carbon cliff and a significant loss of cumulative carbon um, cumulative greenhouse gas mitigation through time but if we start counting for some of the, the other factors like the harvested wood product carbon storage and the um, displacement of fossil fuels and the concrete that we could offset if we start replacing uh, masonry blocks and houses with more timber frame and potentially in the future um, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, we start accumulating very large benefits from that commercial forestry that compensate for that loss of terrestrial carbon. And that's what we look at um, over the next few slides. So obviously after, the, after we harvest the, the commercial forest, we, we, we plant them. So that, that carbon starts to accumulate again. But in the meantime, a fraction of that carbon, maybe 25% maybe or so, 20-25% 20, goes into to quality sawn wood. Um, another fraction of that carbon will go into panel boards, um, chip boards, plywood, other panel boards. A fraction will go into lower quality packaging, cardboard packaging, and these will have different lifespans. So maybe 45 to 70 years for sawn wood, 35 to 60 years for, for, hard, for boards, uh, three to 10 years for packaging materials. So we need to start thinking about that flow of wood coming out of the forest and the fact that that carbon that's in that wood is going to be locked up for some considerable amount of time uh, based on its product breakout, depending on, on which um, products that wood ends up in. And we know that we can, we can put more and more wood into very long-term uses now because we've got uh, engineered timbers, cross laminated timbers, glue lime, which means we can build 80 story buildings. Um, there's an example here in Norway, I think, um, of a, a very tall building that's, that's built with largely with wood. And so we've got these options of locking away that wood for a long time whilst contributing usefully to the economy. And that's doing a very important job in terms of carbon mitigation because we can add that carbon storage onto the carbon that's been stored in the regrown trees in the forest and think about the net sequestration we achieve there. And, and that in the orange here can be quite significant over a 100 year time period. So when we do that with woods, we, we can also replace energy intensive and carbon intensive materials. So we've got a double benefit. We're not only storing that carbon for some time, but we're displacing greenhouse gas emissions that would otherwise be emitted in those materials that we would otherwise use to build the houses, such as masonry blocks, which have high embodied burdens, 0.9 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of block, or steel, which has an embodied burden of at least two kilograms of CO2 per kilogram. Potentially, we've got new products that we can start putting wood into, and that could be useful for using some of the lower grade of wood that doesn't find its way into sawn wood or panel boards. Um, so we could use um, uh, residues and other low grade wood from forestry to produce things like bioplastics in future, and a lot of work has been done looking at this. It's also worth noting that we can have cascading use, and that's what we considered in this work here in the UK, that we might put sawn wood, for example, to another use after it's been in sawn wood. It could go into panel boards and then potentially into uh, to packaging. So we've got possible multiple uses through time with cascading <coughs> uh, circular uses of wood, which could be the ultimate way of keeping carbon locked up for longer, 
um, and also replacing multiple products, uh, not just one product for every kilogram of wood, if you like, that comes out of the forest. And finally, we can think about the, the use of wood for energy. So this probably shouldn't be the first pause of call, but of course we do have lots of rough cuts and residues that aren't very suitable for long-lived products and, and they could go into to bioenergy, which has the benefits of potentially avoiding fossil fuels. We know <clears throat> how urgently we need to move away from fossil fuel use for all sorts of reasons, and we can achieve a 90% plus reduction in emissions by switching from coal, oil, and gas towards uh, wood as an energy source. But what's very useful and interesting about forestry is that if we go for an ambitious forestry planting strategy now, we can start taking up the carbon from the atmosphere um, into trees over the next few decades with, with very high certainty. We know the trees are going to do that. What we don't have yet is carbon capture and storage technology. And yet most of the scenarios for climate stabilization at the global level assume that we're going to need quite significant bioenergy carbon capture and storage to be able to remove CO2 permanently from the atmosphere. That technology isn't commercially scalable yet, but trees buy that time to basically get that technology to work. So if we plant a tree now and harvest it in 40 years, there's a good chance we've got CCS technology working commercially. If we plant a tree now and use most of that timber for, or well, some of that timber, say for sawn wood, um, then that wood that's coming out of buildings uh, won't be coming out of buildings for another 100 plus years. And that should almost certainly give us time to get CCS working. If we put, <clears throat> um, if we put those trees into buildings and then put that wood into another product after the building, we're buying yet more decades of carbon storage before we uh, burn the wood. And we've got more chance, even more chance of getting CCS to work. So there's a very compelling story around trees combined with carbon capture uh, and storage technology in the future of providing a real solution that helps us to take out CO2 from the atmosphere uh, as soon as we can plant those trees effectively, but possibly keep that CO2 locked up out of the atmosphere almost indefinitely, even after we harvest those trees and replant that land with new trees, which will start sucking up more CO2. So that's a possible pathway towards very long-term ongoing carbon removals. And we need those long-term removals to, to offer a balance over a long time period, because we're probably never going to get our emissions down to zero as long as we have economic activity. And so we need, we're always going to need some removals to balance out those residual emissions in the future. Something that was really interesting from this work and looking at these cascading value chains is just how robust the decarbonization or the, the net climate mitigation was from commercial forests, almost irrespective of what you did with the trees, because <clears throat> the primary driver of most of the mitigation was simply the rate of growth of those trees. So you could leave those fast growing Sitka spruce trees in the ground um, for 100 years and of course, by doing that, you're not removing the terrestrial carbon, you're leaving it to accumulate. Maybe the growth rate slows a bit, but you still get significant um, carbon removals through tree growth for the whole 100 year period. On the other hand, you could harvest the trees. And then, as you saw previously in those previous diagrams, you, you could see you had multiple benefits from uh, <clears throat> carbon storage and wood products, from displacement of carbon intensive materials, and finally from fossil fuel substitution in energy use, potentially with carbon capture and storage. So actually, there wasn't, there was only about 10% difference in the net 100 year mitigation from commercial forests, irrespective of how you use the woods, whether it was a, a product heavy product breakout, a bioenergy heavy product breakout, or simply leaving trees in the ground. Um, and even if BEX doesn't work in the future, the fact that you're locking up so much carbon for those 100 years in trees and in products means that you can still derive a lot of mitigation and, and you've got the product substitution credit. So you've only got four to 8% less mitigation, even if CCS doesn't work long-term, in which case we're probably in trouble, but nonetheless, it doesn't undermine the case for forestry as an effective mitigation option. So we've got plenty of choices now, bearing in mind those future trajectories of, of mitigation, such as um, where, how much do we need to plant to offset our emissions in Ireland? Because if the target is to achieve Territorial climate neutrality, we need to make sure we're planting enough trees now and in the next 25 years to be able to offset those emissions, which we anticipate to be ongoing um, after 2050. And agriculture is a big source of those emissions just because it's so difficult to decouple emissions from animals, from 
methane and nitrous oxide from soils are very difficult um, emissions to abate. We don't have the technological solutions that we do for energy generation. Um, so we can consider then the types of tree, the location of these trees, whether or not we can harvest, um, how we use the woods. Those are decisions we can make in the future. And planting now actually provides us with that flexibility to make those decisions one way or another um, in the future. So now we can think about what, what's going to drive that afforestation, which is clear that we need to, to get to our climate neutrality targets. Well, <clears throat> firstly, we know that there's a, a strongly developing carbon market, and it's likely that that carbon market develops uh, much more strongly in the future. <clears throat> and we know that we, we're likely to face real costs because Ireland has targets within the EU under the emission sharing regulation. And we're almost certainly on track at the moment to miss those. We are missing those targets. There is some flexibility in the mechanism to buy emission trading scheme carbon credits um, for the industrial sector. And also if other member states exceed their targets, so we can buy credits from other member states. At the moment, emission trading scheme permits are trading about 80 euros per tonne of CO2. So it's jumped a lot in the last few years and it hits almost 100 euros a tonne uh, last year. There's projections of carbon costs reaching up to 250 euros per tonne by 2050. So then we're talking about serious amounts of money. For every 4 million tonnes of CO2 um, equivalent overshoot at the national level, we're talking about 1 billion euros in, in buybacks of credits, if you like, to try and compensate for that under the regulation. So we're, we're potentially talking about very expensive uh, mitigation being needed or, or purchasing of credits being needed from other countries if we can't generate those credits internally. There's a lot of drive now by private large companies to offset their emissions and the voluntary carbon offset market is much cheaper. It's only about 12 euros per tonne of CO2 at the moment. There's increasing scrutiny of this from environmental and social governments, uh, governance perspectives um, and a demand not just to offset, but where possible to inset. So if companies have value chains that involve land use, um, agricultural production or coffee, it's preferable to try and get that carbon offsetting happening within those value chains within that land. But it's interesting to note that demand for carbon offsetting is already driving up carbon prices and land prices in some countries. So within the last month, there have been two uh, news articles in the Financial Times about <clears throat> the costs of carbon emissions increasing and the fact that large areas are being bought up in some parts of Scotland by private companies who want to start planting trees or managing boglands there to generate credits. Um, to, to count against their business emissions. So this could genuinely drive um, competition for land, if you like, um, in the future. And quite related to this, there's a big ESG drive to get to net zero. And um, there's a kind of investor expectation, if you like, of ambitious decarbonisation or net zero targets amongst companies. And most or many of the big companies in the world, such as Coca-Cola, some big steel companies, have pledged to achieve net zero over the next decade or so. So whilst carbon credits are currently an easy and low cost option, as all these companies start chasing carbon credits as currently a cheaper way of achieving their balance rather than cutting their emissions, which is what really needs to happen very strongly too, it's likely that carbon prices are going to rise very quickly and potentially could skyrocket. Um, there's also increased scrutiny of, of uh, measurement um, uh, and verification of these of these kind of carbon credits so where possible it's better to inset but also with more scrutiny um, there might be a need to tighten up and there might be more need for some of these credits to be sourced more locally and within developed countries where there's stricter governance if you like over what's happening on the ground within Ireland, there's probably going to be pressure um, because of our large agri-food exports and because of the high emissions exceedances at the minute relative to our targets that if we want to sustain green marketing, it might be necessary to really massively in increase um, carbon insetting just in order to sustain those green marketing claims that we've made uh, to maintain competitiveness of Irish milk powder and beef, et cetera, on the international market. So maybe this will be driven by the market, but there is a risk if it's just left to be left to the market that this could be driven indiscriminately and could end up pricing out agri-food production. And there's a kind of question, if you like, should the agri-food sector as a whole and the land sector as a whole in Ireland start to take ownership of some of these actions so that to make sure that these credits that will be generated by 
future tree planting are first prioritised to go towards offsetting emissions from the sector itself so that green claims can be made for that, that, um, those exports in the future. And finally, we know that there's a big demand for woods uh, for the bioeconomy, and that's increasing. So timber frame houses uh, represent about 30% of new builds now. That's up from just 1% in 1990. We've got big potential to increase the use of wood further, especially in large buildings with the use of CLT and glue lamb. And we can do that potentially with Irish timber, according to research that's been done in NUIG. There's a lot of work going into cellulose-derived composites and plastics. And there's a lot of potential to use more wood for renewable heating. We've largely overlooked renewable heating in our drive towards renewable electricity, which of course we need, but there's high temperature heat demand for industry, which is difficult to meet with electricity or heat pumps. And so, and also in old buildings, which aren't well insulated, it's very difficult to use heat pumps. So there's definitely a scope for increased use of wood uh, to provide that higher temperature heat that's needed. We also need dispatchable baseload bioelectricity to complement wind and solar um, into the future. And that's something that, that can be provided by wood. In addition to that, as we saw, large scale wood combustion uh, could be coupled with bioenergy carbon capture and storage, which ensures long-term removal, if you like, of that carbon from the atmosphere. It doesn't, that biogenic carbon doesn't return to the atmosphere upon combustion if we've got a CCS technology in place, which we hope will happen in, in the next 50, within the next 50 years. So it's clear that failure to meet future EU and national climate policy targets could be very expensive. Um, mixed conservation forestry and farm trees deliver a wide range of valuable ecosystem services. And these points really justify significant public investment because they can deliver public goods. Um, so there is a case for strong public investment in forestry. Affiliate policymakers and agri-food processors really need to engage with the scale of zero offsetting that's going to be needed if they want to maintain production in the agri-food sector just because so much offsetting is going to be required to, to maintain the balance and it looks like a minimum of 20,000 hectares per year would be needed to support agricultural output even with very ambitious um, abatement in the agricultural sector. Commercial forestry has a potentially unique role by delivering really effective long-term greenhouse gas mitigation when you start considering the downstream uses of wood, the substitution effects, the possible end use in bioenergy carbon capture and storage systems many decades from now. That's a compelling argument, a compelling role, if you like, for commercial forestry to play a really important uh, role in our climate neutrality targets. The future carbon offset market is likely to drive large scale tree planting. There's a risk of crowding out agri-food insetting and poor spatial distribution if that's not regulated. So that's something that could creep up on us just because of the anticipated huge demand from all these big companies um, looking for a kind of relatively easy way to, to, to offset their emissions. And there's some possibilities to think a little bit differently about climate neutrality. Could Maybe we could engage in this challenge at a catchment scale rather than a national scale, because in that way we might be able to get different landowners and farmers to be talking to one another about how climate neutrality and water quality and biodiversity targets could be met at, at a tangible scale, where everybody can contribute to achieving those targets in an integrated way. Um, over an area of land that, that people are familiar with and know about. So that's perhaps something that could help uh, generate a common good mission, if you like, amongst uh, landholders. So I hope it, I went on a bit longer than, than I wanted to, so I'm sorry about that. And I hope um, there might be some questions. So thanks very much for your attention. Thanks, David. Um, thank you for that really um, fascinating look at what we really have to do. Uh, what forestry has to do, and it's it's sobering to think that you're talking here about a minimum, I think, of 20,000 hectares per annum to achieve the kind of uh, economies of scale necessary. Um, and we have achieved this in the past, um, but currently we're down to around 2,500 hectares, so there's a huge leap there. Just a, a few comments before the questions come in. Um, a, the offsetting of um, or substituting for concrete and steel. You mentioned that we were around, I think, 30% now in timber frame houses. I think that's going up to, that's divided between around 40% in scheme housing, you know, these ones that we see cropping up around the country, semi-detached houses, detached four bedrooms. And, uh, but we've practically made very little impact in apartment buildings in Ireland. 
uh, and you showed them one of your slides, I think it's the one in Bergen in, in, uh, in Norway, where they've gone up to 80 metres, 20, 20 storeys plus, and they're approximately, according to the Bergen people, it's about 80 percent um, timber. Um, given that in Ireland, I, it is almost impossible to go above three storeys uh, in apartments because of planning, because of uh, the fear of fire and various other things. Could you comment on that and how we could influence uh, these policymakers to actually look again at carbon uh, at looking at decarbonizing the economy in construction, given that we are now exporting somewhere in the region of 70% of all timber in this country, uh, when you look at panel board products and solid timber. Yeah, yeah I think that's a, that's a good point, Donal. And the cement sector is responsible for about 3 million tonnes of CO2 annually in, in Ireland. So it's a pretty big contribution to, it's more than 10% uh, of non-agricultural emissions. So I think, um, Trying to do something about reducing those emissions is, is very important and, and wood could help deliver that. So as well as generating the sequestration and uh, the carbon storage benefits, trying to reduce those three million tonnes of CO2 from uh, cement would be something that we could do. And obviously there's more cement used up in, uh, in concrete used in some of these apartment buildings than there would be in conventional houses. So I think it would be a good way of targeting uh, increased carbon storage and substitution credits, especially because as you say there, the, the low rise nature of most of the building in, in Ireland is perfectly suited to using very high shares of timber. Yeah, a uh, question here from Orla Farrell, which is in many ways addressing the, the beginning of your talk and, and indeed throughout the talk of uh, the kind of species that I know you, you don't want to get into individual species, but there we do have fast growing conifers, we do have medium growing um, uh, naturalized species and then we have very slow growing as well uh, species such as oak which take 120 years to to mature or so and uh, Orla is really talking about how we can actually get a broad look at all species rather than at one site where we have in the past concentrated on commercial conifer and uh, currently as well on where people actually are looking for all native uh, and uh, I think the recent survey on forestry was quite enlightening in that regard that people actually didn't differentiate hugely between uh, naturalised native and commercial conifer. In other words, that the bulk of forests that people visit, especially visited throughout the, the pandemic, would have been quilted forests, which really have got a predominance of, of introduced species. Could you comment on that, please? Yeah, <clears throat> I think... Um... I mean, it seems that there are, there's quite, you could have a significant diversification even within productive forests of different species of, of, uh, of conifer, as I understand. So there's, there's definitely potential to increase uh, kind of the, the species mix, if you like, which might be good for resilience and biodiversity, even within productive forests. But there's also a lot of potential of, of having much more mixed forests. From my understanding, it just gets more challenging with the, the harvesting. You've got concepts like continuous cover, which are very compelling from an ecological perspective, as I understand, but perhaps a bit more challenging to implement economically and logistically in terms of getting the equipment in and taking out individual trees. But if we start to value carbon a lot more, like we seem to be doing, there's going to be a lot of value placed on the carbon storage. And as the bioeconomy develops, as we expect it will, there's going to be a lot of extra value placed on the material of fiber coming out of the forest. So if those things become more valuable, you would imagine that there's more room there, there's more opportunity for those higher prices to support much more sophisticated management of the, of the forests. And obviously that's difficult because that's something we anticipate in the future. Um, and yet we have to make those planting decisions which determine the management decisions now. And that's perhaps where the challenge is with forestry. We really need to think ahead. And maybe that's where there's a role for government to kind of bridge that temporal disconnect between where we expect prices to be for carbon and for biomaterials that will come out of forests and, and to maybe bridge some of that gap with what um, farmers are being, might base their business models on today in terms of their planting decisions. Because if we did that, and maybe if some of the public good money and the subsidies were offered for specific types of practices that we think would derive as additional ecosystem services benefits, then that might be a way to to help, if you like, achieve the multiple outputs that we need to from, from forestry. Yeah, and um, you actually briefly discussed leaving trees, including uh, fast-growing conifers, 
into a much longer rotation. And uh, there's a question here from John Cross, which is kind of related to that, really. As you know, we've, we've, we're doing experiments at the moment on continuous cover forestry in Ireland, which is, in many ways, letting the trees grow up and getting the second and third story to come in behind, which has biodiversity. So John's, uh, John's question here is, has any research been done on carbon capture within continuous cover forestry compared with traditional clear fell? And by the way, he says, very interesting talk. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. Yeah. Um, no, I think it's an ongoing question. Like we did work with um, Professor John Healy in Bangor, and it's a question that kept coming up with um, Healy's PhD. Like, what, how would we go about doing an LCA on continuous cover versus um, conventional forests? And it, it's just so difficult because of the timescales involved, like the need to have comparable plots. It, it's a very difficult thing to do empirically. And I think from a modeling perspective, we, we mostly rely on things like the CBM model for determining our kind of carbon accumulation through time. I'm not sure now, I know that's getting more sophisticated, can you differentiate between continuous cover or not? But in, in reality, uh, I, I think the best you could do is kind of take a modeling perspective to say if you had a mix of different ages of stands, you could only differentiate based on the, the age at which you harvest the trees, I think. that's. That's where the modeling is at. We kind of don't really, from what I understand, have good enough data to say if you had the same age categories of trees being extracted from a continuous cover versus the same age categories of trees being extracted from a, a, a clear fell. According to our modeling now, we wouldn't be sensitive at all to any difference in carbon storage between those two systems. And I think that's just where there's perhaps a lack of evidence at the moment. If you left the trees in longer because you've got continuous cover you could probably start to model that and you'd certainly have more carbon sequestration. But as we showed, if you're considering the downstream use of the wood, you might not end up with a very different output over a 100 year time period because there's a strong interchangeability between keeping the carbon in the ground versus using it in products and displacing carbon from other sources. Okay. Um, question here from Owen Cooney says, we have no hope of achieving any of the above targets, unfortunately, as anti-forestry sentiment prevails here. A uh, huge job of work needed to get a realistic planting program underway. I don't know whether this is a comment or a question. Um, although the recent survey was very positive towards uh, needing more trees. But do you want to comment on that, David? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is. There's all sorts of reasons it's very difficult. And something that I've noticed very strongly is that you that there's a kind of uh, polarization, if you like, and um, kind of thought that farmers either would like to be producing foods or, or foresters would be like to, to be managing trees. But somehow, if we take, if we think to the future, whether or not people have different views on climate change, but it's happening and carbon costs are being driven up, business activities are going to ensure that they're driven up a lot further. So there is going to be this real challenge for Ireland's agricultural sector to maintain credibility of producing milk and beef for export with a relatively green image. Um, is going to require really dramatic action. So that means that the interests of the agricultural sector, the food production and the forestry sector are 100% aligned in that sense. I mean, you can't have high agri-food outputs in the future, from most of the visions of the future we can think about without having much bigger offsets. So I think trying to align those visions is one way to perhaps get the sentiment more, <laughs> I, I don't know how you do it, but there is this polarization. Maybe that, that was the point at the end of the presentation. If yeah. you think of catchment levels, maybe catchment levels are more tangible to get the farmers and the foresters working together um, okay. to achieve this balance. Yeah. Um, the question from Gerhard Gallagher is, can you envisage a realistic time scale to turn the ship around from two and a half thousand hectares to 20,000 hectares? And I think the most pertinent, and what would the impact of failure be? I presume fines from yeah. Europe, but, but yeah. the bigger global um, climate change uh, yeah. question as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, Ireland is a, is a smallish country, so you could be cynical and say, What's the, what's the impact of Ireland on the global climate? But that's the road to nowhere. I mean, we, we know we have to do something and we are in the EU, thankfully, and the EU has actually, it's kind of keeping everybody in shape on this. So I think simply the, the emission sharing regulation means we're going to have to pay huge amounts of money. Like I said, it could be a billion euros for every 4 million tonnes of exceedance every year. So I think the, the scale of those costs in the future if carbon prices go up, it's just kind of demand change. That's just going to mean that it's, it, it's just not sensible for Ireland to pay other countries to, to offset when Ireland can offset so effectively with fast growing trees at home. I think that, that will fundamentally shift things. The question is, 
it will only shift things when it's too late because it's only after those prices kick in that we realize we should have planted trees 20 years ago. So that's the importance of looking ahead and planning now, I think. For it. Yeah. Question could be controversial here on com compulsory purchase of roads to get a good road, road network going. Is there any case to be made for compulsory purchase of land for forestry? Uh, is it realistic to assume that we will be able to convince farmers to plant at these levels outlined given the for current difficulties in the sector? Yeah, well, I mean, you could argue that it is a public goods issue. And when you're talking about that scale of costs in the future and, and also public opinion, I think, is shifting as, as we see the climate emergency developing and just the extreme events like this. Last week, they said both poles, the North Pole and the South Pole, were 30 degrees above average. I mean, that's just that's worse than the worst scientists, uh, the scientists' worst projections. So I think as we see these extreme events, then yeah. people change their, their opinion. And I think that's the ticket to changing policy to maybe you end up with draconian things, but probably the price uh, will kick in before that to, to drive change. Okay, Donna Whelan here, is there any payment system or model from another country that David is aware of that could be looked at here as a model for payment to landowners for reimbursement of the ecosystem service that forests provide? Because the carbon payment is a huge one, but yeah. what else, David? I don't know. I mean, that, that's a good question. I wish I knew more about that, about that. I'm sure there'd be people maybe like Jane Stout and Trinity that have done a lot of work on payment for ecosystem services. But it's clear that the value of those ecosystem services avoided water pollution, for example, um, avoided ammonia emissions um, by, by not having so much agricultural activity in certain areas. And th those alone are, are, are very valuable, potentially even more valuable than the carbon because ammonia is valued at 5,000 euros or more per tonne emitted. And then the health benefits would be huge. Like we know how much we spend on healthcare. So if we start seriously stacking those benefits up, those co-benefits, we end up with a very compelling case for, for intervention and for, for subsidy, if you like. Um, anonymous um, question here. Congrats on Nick's and talk, very informative. Does rewetting of organic soil have a short-term impact of increasing emissions of a methane in certain situations. Is there a case for concentrating on methane reduction in the short term because of its uh, climate impact? Yeah, that's a good question. You do end up with a, a counter effect. So there is a penalty. I think we, we did calculate. So if you, if you ambitiously rewet all the organic area and you use the default emission factors for methane, it's, it's the equivalent of having 200,000 extra dairy cows, basically. So there is going to be a trade-off in the future. We increase our re-wetting. We massively drive down emissions of CO2 and N2O. But if we do take up some of our methane budget, if we have a separate methane budget, it means we're going to have to destock a little bit to compensate for that emission from the, the organic soil. It does happen quickly, though, with the re-wetting. Um, how quickly it happens in reality, certainly in the accounting mechanism, that happens immediately. Um, once you've re-wetted it, you can discount those almost 20 tonnes of CO2 emitted annually from those organic soils. So it can give us quite a quick win. And there is a lot of pressure to reduce methane. And I think that's in the pipeline now, probably with separate methane targets coming from the EU in the future. That, that will be a driver of change in the agricultural sector, I think. Yeah. Question here from Len Gallagher. Good to hear from Len. Uh, it was, uh, he talks about... Uh, a research program going back 50 years now, or to develop seven-story timber frame apartments, or can we modernize fire and safety rigs to allow similar developments in Ireland? Yeah, I mean, my understanding is that in, there aren't really any safety issues when it's, when it's constructed properly. It's just regulations have lagged behind the reality of what's possible with, with mass timber these days, engineered timber. So... I think it's just improving the evidence base that, that these regulators use. Yeah, thanks for that, David. And um, uh, by the way, David has another talk uh, shortly, so we'll we'll go for another couple of minutes and then we'll we'll cut it at that stage. Uh, a question here from uh, James Hamilton, who is who congratulates you, David. Uh, do you think existing forests should be able to avail of carbon credits as at present the current? Uh, schemes only allow for additional, uh, i.e. new forestry planting to be eligible. Certainly uh, that is the case in Northern Ireland. It seems very unfair for us that have been involved in forestry for years. That has yeah. come up in a couple of webinars I've been at. Yeah, that's just a very difficult question. I think it's, it's important there is an inherent unfairness in new entrants who are later to the, 
game being paid more. At the same time, it's kind of reflecting where we're going with the climate emergency, if you like, and the value of carbon. So I think it's just going to go in that direction. But at the same time, I guess, if we look at it longer term, when people come to replant forests, would there be incentives at the replanting stage? I'm not sure, like, or other ways of rewarding people for um, uh, sending wood to more long-term downstream uses, like getting a higher share into um, into long-lived products. Could mills be paid for that if they get a higher share out into long-lived products and transfer some of that back to the foresters who are providing the wood that might not have been eligible for credits in the short term for planting? I, I don't know. It's tricky. I'm, I'm not sure the best way of managing the incentives okay. here. Um, question here from Con Little. Uh, is there a difference or any benefit to plant trees, uh, to plant the lands uh, to be re-wetted, to be wetted rather than wetting them? Those planting versus rewetting. Yeah, it seems not like it seems if you've got organic soil that um, typically you don't get as high yields anyway, from what I understand, and and your your emissions are just so high from the inevitable degree of drainage that you have from planting. Um, unless you can plant really native species, like just let shrubland kind of develop. Maybe that's the only option really to um, to use those those organic soils but it, it just seems that the, that the emissions are just don't compensate for any benefits you get then from the wood that's that's on them okay i think at this stage david we'll um we call a halt to it um first of all i'd like to really thank you for uh a really uh you know challenging presentation and i know since i uh, heard you first approach this topic at some time ago in, in the rds um, I was really anxious to get your take on it for the Society of Irish Foresters as well. So really, thank you very much for that. And uh, good, good luck with your work. I know you're, you're rotating at the moment between NUIG and the University of Limerick, but good work, yeah. good, luck, good luck with those works. And thanks, Theresa O'Brien as well. Could I just say before we uh, leave, I'd like to thank all the people who sent in questions. And uh, if you actually have a question to wasn't asked, answered, or you didn't get in, you can always email info at soif.ie. That's info at soif.ie. And also you can email that. And I think in the next couple of weeks, we'll have this particular presentation online as well. It'll be available on YouTube. So that's it. But before I leave, I'd like to, um, to remind people that there's a very interesting webinar coming up organized by the Irish Timber Growers Association. Uh, it's about the use of earth observation, satellite and drone technology in forestry. And there are two really good speakers in this. There's Dr. Michael Schmidt, who's the General Director of Interinstitutional Projects at Canabio, Mexico. And he's discuss discussing applied aerial technology. And Keen Gallagher is also looking at the practical use of imagery from satellite and drone sensors for everyday use in forestry. Uh, the webinar is free. And it'll commence at 10 a.m. and conclude at 11.30 on next this day week on the 31st of March. Now, I, I, I think I actually put that down for today if you're reading the Irish Farmers Journal. But it's next Thursday at 11.30, uh, between 10 o'clock and 11.30. So if you Google forestry.ie, you'll get a link onto that. And that particular um, uh, webinar is supported by the Irish Farmers Journal and part funded by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. And as I said, it's free. So once again, thanks very much to David and good luck in your future research. And thanks again to uh, Pat O'Sullivan and to, to Teresa O'Brien. And thanks, thanks very much. Everybody. Everybody. Thanks. Yeah, and at one stage we had, we are now slipping, members are slipping away, it's down to 85, but at one stage I think it was up to 104. So that just shows uh, the level of interest at the moment in what you're doing, David. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks all.